Okay, everyone, welcome. This is Professor Antonelli, and today we are delving into our discussion of Chapter 14, which has to do with personality. Just to refresh your memory, when we talked about Chapter 13, we were really talking about social psychology and how people behave um, in certain ways and the why of how they act um, the way they do was kind of answered in that particular chapter in a number of ways. Today, the discussion on personality kind of helps to explain, again, behaviors and people acting in certain ways through their personalities and what those personalities are. Okay, so this chapter actually offers theories about kind of the nature of personality. What is it all about? It is broken up into sections, sections that have to do with the theorists behind personality, and there's a number of them with names that you probably have heard from your reading, as well as some descriptions of personality, and then actually how we going go about measuring personality. That's a big piece to this, okay? So let's first talk about the straight-out definition of personality. Uh, there's a Latin section of the word personality, the word persona, which really means mask. It's this mask of someone, you know, we're seeing or not seeing. So the straight out definition is that personality is all the consistent ways in which the behavior of one person different, differs from that of another, especially in social situations, okay? There are some things that are not considered part of personality when we're talking about differences among people. And some of these things include learning, memory, sensation, or athletic skills. Those things are not considered um, part of personality, okay? So just so you keep a couple of distinctions in your head, all right? There are many theorists that have ideas that relate to personality and parts of personality. One of them, Sigmund Freud and the psychodynamic approach, is where we're going to start. However, I will say that, please keep in mind, most psychologists actually are have always been highly skeptical of Freud and his ideas. So while we're going to present some of these ideas, uh, I need you to keep that in mind, that there are many psychologists that, you know, really don't um, think of Freud as someone that we should base all of our ideas about personality on, okay? Um, psychodynamic theory, Freud's theory, kind of relates personality um, to how these conflicting forces within a person are actually playing out, okay? Unconscious ones um, that an individual may not know about, uh, they're kind of these internal forces that we don't either know or going on within us or we don't understand. It's almost like there's a tug of war going on inside us when it comes to these conflicting forces. And these forces within us are what's guiding um, and, and kind of molding our personality, okay? These unconscious forces Freud was searching for are, going, there's a few names and, and terminology associated with this. The first one is known as catharsis, which is where we have this pent up emotional tension and it's released in a catharsis. This is not necessarily good. Um, for example, when you're watching, let's say, a sad movie and you cry, a lot of times this crying actually will make you feel worse. Okay, so while some people see, oh, I had a catharsis, I, you know, released this pent up emotional tension, it's not always a good thing. All right. Another term to remember when we talk about Freud and how he was really trying to figure out this unconscious idea within us is this method of psychoanalysis where he's trying to bring those unconscious thoughts and emotions into our consciousness um, where, okay, should we be able to talk through something? And that's not always the case. And then the word unconscious, um, sometimes, you know, traumatic experiences and conflicts that we have in childhood um, were forced into our unconscious memory where we keep things in there that we didn't know were in there and that we don't um, bring out. And uh, they can affect our behavior even though we often cannot talk about them. So they almost have like an influence over our behavior even though we often don't know where they're coming from or what they are exactly. So 
there's a lot of unknowns here. Very important to remember. Okay. Initially, um, you know, Freud's theory said one thing, and then there were some additional changes related to it. So initially neurotic behavior of individuals was attributed to kind of a recent traumatic experience that they might have had. So to explain this a bit, he kind of, Freud kind of pointed to childhood sexual abuse as the cause of personality problems. However, later then he said that that particular problem, neurotic behavior was, you know, the, the problem was um, related to childhood sexual fantasies, things like the Oedipus complex, which you might have heard of. The Oedipus complex is, according to Freud, where, um, you know, a period of time where a boy starts developing a sexual interest in his mother and then feels some sort of competitive aggression toward his father. Okay, it's, we've, I'm sure you've heard that term, but again, this is just something that, you know, Freud used as a way to try to explain, you know, some neurotic behavior and traumatic experiences that may have happened in childhood related to sexual abuse. Okay, his only evidence, actually, for his view was that he could actually kind of infer these events um, from his patients telling them his their dreams and what kind of symptoms they were having. There was nothing concrete that Freud could get out of this. It was, you know, more that, you know, someone told me, one of my patients told me their dreams or told me the symptoms that they're having, and I made an inference. That's what, that's what Freud was doing with his theory, okay? So, um, you know, whether right or wrong, um, beliefs about Freud's theory are out there. Freud is so widely known that we really do have to kind of just mention his stages, which are on this next slide, okay? Uh, the first stage, the oral stage from birth to about a year and a half, um, some of the sexual interests that the child has is sucking, swallowing, and biting, and um, just some things to remember here that the child gets pleasure from eating, drinking, and other oral activities, and there are lasting concerns with how dependent or independent a child becomes during this stage. Then at the anal stage, um, one and a half to three years, this was, the focus with, of this stage was, you know, expelling feces and re retaining the feces, you know, holding in or, you know, expelling. And the effects of, you know, being fixated at this stage was, you know, is the child going through an orderliness or a sloppiness? Are they stingy or wasteful, you know, keeping things to themselves or just discarding them quickly? Or do they, you know, are they experiencing a stubbornness? Okay. Then from three to five, three to five or six years old, we have the phallic stage. This is where touching of the genitals occurs and the Oedipus complex is brought forth. And again, some effects that could happen if one is stuck at this stage is they have difficulty feeling a closeness to others. Um, you know, males fear castration um, and females have this idea that, you know, they're envious of the male genitalia. All right. And then from five or six to puberty, we have what's called the latent period where any sexual interest is actually suppressed. Um, there's not much discussion there. And we can see no effects being fixated at this stage and the genital stage starts at puberty and goes onward and this the sexual interests here are contact with other people and again there doesn't seem to be any specific um, effects that have been identified okay so that's Freud's um, stages all right uh, Freud also kind of brought all of his ideas into this idea of personality. And he has three aspects that he put out there. The id, the ego, and the superego. The id is kind of this um, inner, you know, sexual and other biological drive that kind of demands immediate gratification, okay? Immediate gratification, remember, is that concept of can, do I get something now or can I wait a little bit and get something better, like the marshmallow experiment. Just kind of think about that when you talk about immediate gratification. And then his second aspect, the ego, is the rational decision-making part of someone's personality where, you know, it's similar to, if you remember in chapter seven, we talked about information processing. It's very similar to that uh, piece of 
speak, central executive in our brains that actually kind of guides all of our uh, thinking and how we're processing information, okay? So the ego being more of the rational side. And then the super ego is, you know, the memory of kind of the rules and things that we were told we couldn't do that we learned from our parents and others. And a good example of this is maybe our parents, you know, would say things like, well, nice little boys and girls don't do that, whatever that is, okay? And this is that kind of uh, piece of that, the super ego, all right? The ego part is the interesting part I want to focus on here because the ego part of personality, according to Freud, uses some of the following what we call defense mechanisms against anxiety. So let's talk about what some of them are. Repression is one of them. And this is where we, you know, intentionally remove something uh, that we don't want to think about to the unconscious. So we kind of, let's say, have an unacceptable memory of something um, or something we just don't want to think about and we'll say, okay, let's move it into that area of our unconscious. I don't want to deal with it. All right. Denial is actually, you know, refusal to believe something. So think of the words, this can't be happening. Okay. That's denial. Then we have something called rationalization is where we try to figure out a way to say my actions are justified. So a good example is, you know, you're studying for a test um, and you have the chance to, let's say, go out. Instead, you know, you say, well, more studying won't do me good anyway. Okay. I'm trying to rationalize that. Displacement is where we kind of divert you know, a behavior or a thought, you know, to something less threatening. So for example, if you're angry at your employer for, I don't know, doing something, cutting your hours, doing whatever, um, instead of yelling at your employer, you yell at someone else. So you've displaced what, you know, you really want to be yelling at the employer by yelling at someone else. Okay. Regression is where you kind of go backwards. You, re you return to something that's, you know, a level of functioning that's more immature. So, for example, when a new uh, baby is born, if they have a sibling um, who's older, that older sibling tends to kind of cry and pout and have temper tantrums. They regress because of the birth of that new sibling who's probably getting more of the attention at that point. All right. Another defense mechanism is known as projection where we attribute our own kind of undesirable characteristics to other people. For example, someone might say, I'm not angry. You're the one who's angry. Okay, so I projected that onto someone else. Okay, we're going to see projection actually later on in this PowerPoint as well. Um, reaction formation is we kind of present ourselves the opposite of what you know, one really is um, as a way to kind of make us feel better and reduce our anxiety. So for example, if I am aggressive, I would go and join a group that tries to prevent violence and aggression. So I'm kind of doing the opposite of what, you know, I really am. All right. And the last one is kind of questionable. It's known as sublimation. And this is where we transform um, aggressive or sexual energies into something that's culturally acceptable, um, or even behaviors that are, you know, admired by others. So for example, someone may sublimate aggressive impulses by, let's say, becoming a surgeon. Okay. So, you know, they transform what these negative energies are into something, you know, more positive or at least what's more acceptable. Okay. So those are all the slides around Freud's theory, things to know, terms, um, ideas, ego being one of the most important ones, all right? Then we have another theorist related to personality, Karen Horney, who's actually a neo-Freudian. And neo-Freudians were psychologists who actually kept a piece or parts of Freud's theory, but then they kind of altered other parts of the theory that they didn't necessarily agree with, okay? So um, Karen Horney revised some of uh, Freud's theories by you know, adding in pieces about, you know, feminine psychology. She's known very well for feminine psychology. And, and one of the things related to feminine psychology, she argued, was that women often feel frustrated when they're forced into subordinate roles. So again, not as well known um, of a theorist, but again, part of this idea of feminine psychology, which again, will play into personality at some point. Okay. Another theorist uh, personality theorist we, in this presentation is Carl Jung, 
that's how you say his name. And he had this idea of the collective unconscious, which this collective unconscious concept is similar for nearly all people. All people have this collective unconscious. And the collective unconscious is filled with things called inborn thoughts and images from preceding generations. What that means is the experiences that our ancestors had are in every single individual's mind, okay? They, everyone shares kind of the same common experiences that our ancestors in the past had. So he's an interesting piece to personality because those, those inborn thoughts, those inborn images of experiences our ancestors had, we all kind of share. So our personalities may show that when we can relate to others, okay? Um, another personality theorist, Alfred Adler, his, um, he began a school of thought that was known as individual psychology, where we looked at the psychology of the person, a whole individual or being, rather than a person as parts, okay? So we kind of looked at the whole person. And he basically felt that everyone has this natural, what we call, what he called, striving for superiority, where the person wanted, you know, seeks this excellence and fulfillment and we create a plan and we use goals um, to achieve this. All right. We want to, we want to be personally fulfilled and we want to just be excellent people. We strive to be superior. Okay. According to him, um, the healthiest style of life is one that emphasizes social interests, but not just success for ourselves, but rather for a larger group, this idea of social interest. So beyond just setting our own goals and striving for personal excellence, we also want to, you know, identify and have a solidarity with a larger group of people that can then lead us as a group to, you know, constructive action in the, in the world. All right. So individual but then besides individuality, we, we want to come together, you know, with a larger group and have success as a group to move, you know, life forward, basically. All right. Um, well, how do we develop our personality? We develop our personality through something called the learning approach, okay, which is what we do um, in one situation after another through imitating behaviors of others. Some of these behaviors that we imitate, um, some, you know, are things that we copy because we think we like them and some we actually avoid. We won't imitate them or copy them. Okay. That the learning approach is this idea of personality. We look around us, we see what's going on. Um, and then we decide, okay, um, I'm going to imitate this person's behavior and how they behaved in a certain situation, and I'd like to copy that, okay? That's the idea of um, the learning approach, all right? Another perspective on personality, before we get into more theorists, okay, is a perspective called the humanistic perspective, humanistic psychology. It's a field of psychology that emphasizes consciousness, values, and abstract beliefs. We have an awareness of these abstract beliefs, all right? And according to these humanistic psychologists, personality kind of depends on how people, uh, the beliefs that people have and how they perceive the world. So for example, if you actually believe that a particular experience you had was highly meaningful, then you know what? It was highly meaningful. Okay. So it's this idea that you believe something, then that's what it is. Okay. So people are essentially good is another idea behind humanistic psychologists. Um, they strive to achieve their potential. They want to be better. Um, they want to get to their potential. They're also free to make deliberate and conscious decisions. This is the idea behind humanistic psychology. It kind of adds that human piece to people in, to our personalities. Okay. Um, now we have the most influential humanistic psychologist to remember is Carl Rogers. And Carl Rogers' biggest idea is called unconditional positive regard. 
and what unconditional positive regard is, is where it's the complete un unqualified acceptance of another person as he or she is. Or in other words, the idea that even if you disapprove of someone's actions or intentions, you still accept and love them. So anyone who's a parent can think of this as, you know, no matter what my child does, I will still accept and love them. That's what the idea of unconditional positive regard is. I look at people in a positive way, despite if I don't like what they're doing or if I disapprove of something they're doing or saying, okay, I'm still going to accept them and have a positive regard for them. Okay. Another humanistic psychologist, um, is Abraham Maslow. Abraham Maslow had this idea of what we call a self-actualized personality where, you know, self-actualization as a term means it's the achievement of your full potential, okay? There are certain characteristics that someone who has a self-actualized personality has, and um, one of them is that we have an accurate or true perception of reality. We see the world as it is, not as we would like it to be. Okay, we also, if we have a self-actualized personality, we have an independence, a creativity, and a spontaneity about us. We accept ourselves and others, which is very similar to that unconditioned positive regard that we just talked about on the slide before um, of Carl Rogers. We also have a problem-centered outlook rather than a self-centered outlook. We actually try to see how to solve problems, not how to just make ourselves look good. If we have a self-actualized personality, we truly want to solve a problem. It doesn't necessarily have to make us look good. It's just as we're trying to solve this problem. In addition, if we have a self-actualized personality, we have a, a true enjoyment of life through wanting positive experiences and keeping and having positive experiences. And we also have a good sense of humor if we have a self-actualized personality. So um, Maslow and Rogers, humanistic psychologists, talking about the human experience and um, things related to it. Okay. The second module kind of uh, talks about um, some personality traits. Let's, let's think about this for a second. Psychologists actually study personality in two ways or through two approaches. These are known as the nomothetic and the ideographic. And each of these approaches is pr pretty, pretty simple to understand. The first one, the nomothetic approach, is you know where we look at some broad and general principles of personality, nothing too specific, such as more, let's say, extroverted people um, usually are more likely to introduce themselves to a stranger. So we're looking at extroversion as a, a broad general principle of personality, and we kind of can make the assumption that they're more likely to introduce themselves to a stranger. The ideographic approach is more um, individualized, where we study personality um, of specific individuals, looking at very specifically what makes one a special person, such as their individualized goals and moods and reactions to situations, okay? So one is broad, one is more specific to individuals, um, you know, and that's the difference between the two kinds of research that psychologists often do to study personality, okay? Personality actually differs by things called traits and states. They rhyme, so you can help you remember that. Um, a trait is this long-lasting kind of consistent tendency that we see people behave in ways such as shyness, hostility, talkativeness. It's very consistent. Um, a state is actually more of a temporary um, activation of what we call a particular behavior. When some, you know, when you ever hear someone say, I am in such a state right now, like they're not always like that. Okay. It's just at this particular time. Okay. So I'll give you a, an example of a trait versus a state. Being nervous 
most of the time is a trait if, if you're a nervous person in general. But let's say you are just afraid right now of something for today or tomorrow, you know, or this week you tend to be. That's a state that you're in. Okay, there's a difference. All right. Traits and st- traits and states are descriptions of behaviors. They are not explanations for it. What that means is to say that someone is nervous and quiet, it doesn't really explain anything. It's not going to tell us why someone is nervous or quiet. Okay. It's just a description of the behavior that we're seeing. Okay. So that's important to keep in mind. All right. In addition, in our discussion for personality, we are trying to find, we are searching for broad personality traits. When we use this trait approach from what we just talked about, consistent things of personality, when we use this trait approach to personality, we are trying to study and measure these consistent personality traits. How exactly can we do that? Well, we can do that through self-reports. However, self-reports are not entirely accurate. There's always going to be issues, which we'll talk about later on in the PowerPoint, to self-reports. All right. Um, a problem, one of the examples of a measurement problem have we have has to do with self-esteem. And the problem that we have with self-esteem is that it's a person's evaluation of their own abilities, their performance, and their worth. And because the person is evaluating this themselves, you know, there are issues with measuring it. Researchers have a difficult time measuring self-esteem because depending on the questions that are asked, um, something that looks like it might be low self-esteem might indicate high goals that the person has. And therefore, it's more of a lack of satisfaction that that person has with how they're doing or performing. So for example, there's an item, uh, a questionnaire item, then when we're trying to look at personality traits, and the item may say, quote, I'm not doing as well as I in school as I'd like. Well, again, you can't necessarily interpret that as low self-esteem if a person, you know, checks that as one of the things on their questionnaire. Because they could just have higher goals and, you know, are not as satisfied with whatever they're, however they're doing in school, okay, currently. So that's one of the issues with measuring it. Um, Also, one of the issues with measuring um, self-esteem is that, you know, people could have a reluctance to kind of, as I say, toot their own horn or brag, okay? So they're going to be modest in how they're answering the questions because they don't want to look like they're bragging, quite simply, okay? So when we talk about these traits, can we narrow personality down to just a few traits? And the answer, um, according to this this, uh, section on personality, is yes. And the way that they went about doing this was they had uh, a list of about 18,000 words that they thought related to personality traits. They were able to narrow those 18,000 words down to 35 traits. Okay. Then they were able to group those 35 traits into some sort of, I guess you could call them clusters or categories. And that came up, gave us the final, what we call big five personality traits. And these um, big five personality traits are down at the bottom here, and they are emotional stability, um, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness to new experience. Okay. In doing this, um, the psychologists, you know, when they found these clusters, they wanted them to correlate strongly with one another, um, but not with other clusters. So when they were, they were trying to cut down these 35, they f- tried to group the ones that correlated to each other, but didn't correlate to any of the others. And that's how we ended up with the five-factor model that you see here. 
okay? So the next slide actually discusses them a little bit more in detail. These are the five traits. Um, a good way to remember this is the word um, ocean, and let me explain why, all right? You're going to say, I don't see an N here. Ocean, O stands for openness, C stands for conscientiousness, E stands for extroversion, A stands for agreeableness, and you say, okay, well, where's the N? The fifth trait is emotional stability. Well, here's what you need to remember. Um, the opposite of emotional stability is neuroticism. It's where, you know, you're, it, it, it's, it's the opposite of being emotionally stable is experiencing these unpleasant emotions. So being neurotic about something. And that's where they kind of think, okay, we'll put the N here as the opposite of emotional stability. So we can come up with a, if you recall, like a, um, a mnemonic device to remember this, O-C-E-A-N, ocean, helps you remember these five factors of personality. Okay. So let's take each one. Emotional stability means we're able to resist anything unpleasant. Um, and there's lots of true-false questions to measure this on a uh, personality test. One of them could be, you know, I have few major worries. You know, if you're emotionally stable, your answer to that should be true, all right? Um, extroversion is this idea of seeking excitement and social contact where, again, um, if I make friends easily, if that's true, if you answer true to that, then, you know, this is a, a personality trait that you exhibit. Agreeableness is being compassionate and trusting or having a concern for others' welfare. And the question uh, or statement, I believe others have good intentions. If you answer true to that, then most likely you have this, you know, characteristic personality trait of agreeableness. Conscientiousness means being self-disciplined and dutiful, uh, hardworking. And the question or statement would be, I complete most tasks on time or early, you know, demonstrating a conscientiousness. Um, openness means stimulated by new ideas. You enjoy listening to new ideas, participating in kind of new things, all right? And the statement is, I believe art is important for its own sake, for example. And, you know, if you answer true for that, then, you know, you're thinking that, okay, this is an area that I could come up with lots of new ideas and be stimulated and enjoy them. Okay. The other thing to remember, I just want to bring up is that these two particular factors, agreeableness and conscientiousness, these two correlate very highly with success and successful people. So something to keep in mind there for this five factors model. Okay, how does heredity and environment actually influence personality? Well, remember, we keep talking about nature and nurture throughout our course this semester, all right? Heredity is the nature part, and environment is the nurture part, just to review for you. So does heredity influence personality? Um, yes, to a degree. And does environment influence personality? And the answer is no, not really. Okay. So again, we've looked at studies of twins and adopted children, like we've done for many other things in our course to explain things. And research has found that heredity does contribute somewhat, is the word, to things that we see um, people's personality to be. Okay. However, here's the however, there's not one single gene that we can identify that controls, you know, people's varying personalities. Then we've also found that the environment of the family um, really contributes very, very little to personality. Okay. So that's the environmental or nurturing piece. All right. Sometimes variation in personality re relates to something that we call, term down here, unshared environment. Um, what the unshared environment um, means is that we look at aspects of an environment from one individual to another, even within a family, and it's things like, let's say, a particular teacher that individuals have, um, or a specific injury or illness. And these things can differ from one individual to another, even siblings within a family. Um, and that's that kind of can impact their personality, all right, and uh, the variations in personalities between people. However, it's very, very difficult to investigate um, the unshared environment, which makes it very difficult to clearly understand the link there, 
All right, so just be aware of that. In addition to heredity and environment, how does age, culture, and the time you live in influence your personality? Well, and this slide talks about three different ways. And one of them is the older people get, the more slowly they change. So here's where personality starts to become more fixed as you get older, if you stay in the same environment and you do the same things year after year. Okay. A second <clears throat> influence related to culture is that the self ratings we see from one country uh, to another, we can't easily compare them. Okay. We can't easily compare the rating scales that people fill out from one country to another, but the best way to do it to compare personalities across cultures is to actually just observe the behavior of the individuals within those cultures. Okay. And then we can actually see if there was an influence on it. All right. Um, in addition, researchers, researchers have actually found that there are differences in personality between generations. So your grandparents, to your parents, to you is what we mean by generational differences. Okay. And as a result of that, each of those generations lived during a certain time period. All right. And that time period in which you lived and your parents lived and your grandparents lived exerts a real major influence on personality development. Okay. So for example, um, measurements of anxiety we have found have you know, steadily increased since the 1950s. All right. So the next uh, slide works with this and just kind of gives you some things to look at <clears throat> with these charts, with these graphs that, sh you know, kind of look at six different personality aspects, um, conscientiousness, openness. Some of these are part of the big five, and then they add in additional ones up here of social vitality and social dominance. And that it shows these different patterns of change over what we call longitudinal studies. Remember, longitudinal takes place over many years that we study individuals. And we look at the different time frames they've been exposed to and how <clears throat> there have been changes, whether they're increases or decreases. So this is an interesting chart. Don't want to spend too much time on it. You can take a look at it, all right? <clears throat> the last piece to this uh, chapter has to do with how we measure personality. So the question to start us off with is, can people judge their own personalities through interpreting their scores on a personality test, let's just say? The answer is not really. And the question is why? Well, why can't they do this? It's because of what is known as the Barnum effect. The Barnum effect is where we have a tendency to accept the vague or unclear descriptions of, you know, our own personality, you know, based on what we're seeing and um, our scores on the test. But this is really kind of um, based on P.T. Barnum, who, if you know, is a, was a circus owner who specialized in fooling people out of their money. And so the comparison to that and these personality tests are that the personality tests may fool people as well. So that we must, the test must be carefully kind of analyzed and really scrutinized to ensure that they're measuring what they claim to measure. So the idea is, is that we can't just take a test, a personality test and say, okay, that's my personality. We have to really analyze it for this Barnum effect. Is the test kind of trying to fool us um, in some way into believing our personality is one way or another, okay? So we really have to always be cautious of personality tests, all right? And it's not that they're bad. We just have to be cautious of them, okay? So can we actually standardize personality tests and how? Remember, we discussed standardizing a test in an earlier chapter, and we talked about the ways that we do that. A standardized, um, you know, by standardizing a test, it applies certain rules um, to specify how we actually are going to interpret the results. There are certain rules that must be applied in order for a, a test to be called a standardized test. And we must determine how the scores will be distributed, the distribution of scores, in order for us to standardize a test so that we can see 
if a particular score on a personality test is within what we call the normal range or whether it is outside that range. Because if it is outside that range, then it could possibly indicate a disorder. And by disorder, in our discussion for this chapter, we're talking about a personality disorder, okay? So we have to determine, you know, the distribution of scores. If you recall, we did that for IQ testing and we had a range of scores within the norm and then ones that were above and ones that were below. This is a similar thing to discuss when we talk about standardizing personality test scores, all right, in order to make them valid, all right? So let's look at some examples of personality tests. Well, there is an objective personality test which is very widely used and it's called the MMPI for short, but what it stands for is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. And it basically is a standardized test that has a bunch of true-false questions on it that are intending to measure certain personality dimensions. All right. There were originally, it came out in the 1940s with 550 test items. And then in 1990, we had a revision of that test, and that's why it's called the MMPI-2, because that means it was a revision or a second edition of the original. And in 1990, when this came out, it had 567 items to it, all right? And here's a couple of examples of those items. One example or statement on the um, inventory was, I am glad that I am alive. And you would have to answer true or false to that. And depending on your answer, it could indicate depression um, as part of your personality dimension. And then another example of an item is, I have the time of my life at parties. Well, again, depending if you answer true or false, it is a trying to identify, you know, a personality dimension of being socially introverted or not. All right. The problem um, with this personality test is sometimes there are is deception or lying that goes on there are items that are placed on the test that should be common for all people okay meaning they all people should answer those particular items in the same way and if they don't then it's an indicator or detection that someone is lying when they're answering that particular question, all right? Because some of the items have what we call common faults on them, items that every single person should answer in the same way because they're common to all to answer in the same way. And if they don't, then we know that possibly there could be, you know, lying going on for the person taking the inventory, all right? Another more recent personality test is called um, the Neo PI R. It's called the Neo Personality Inventory and Revised. All right. This test measures the big five personality traits that we just discussed a few slides ago. Remember, these are neuroticism, um, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. All right. There are 240 items on this particular inventory. And an example of one of them is I keep my promises. And I keep my promises actually, um, you would have to choose an answer on a Likert scale again from very inaccurate to moderately inaccurate, neither to moderately accurate, to very accurate. So where would you fall? What answer would you pick for I keep my promises? And that particular uh, statement or item on the inventory is a measure of conscientiousness. All right. And there's, again, 240 items like that to try to get at all of these uh, big five personality traits. Another test, um, personality test, and it's what we call a test of normal personality, is known as the Myers-Briggs type indicator. And this normal personality idea is very loosely based on, if you remember Carl Jung, we talked about him earlier in the, this PowerPoint um, and his theory. And this MBTI for short kind of classifies people into, I guess you could call them choice categories where does it classify someone as extroverted or introverted? as sensing or intuitive, as thinking or feeling, or as judging or perceiving. And what it does is 
let's say someone takes the um, this this item test here, and the result could be that you are classified as an introverted here and it intuitive thinking and judging person okay that it, it, it basically has a series of items that will you know kind of try to get at if you are one or the other of each of these and then kind of put them together as you're an introverted intuitive thinking judging person okay or you're an extroverted sensing feeling perceiving person okay that's what it does the problem with it is that it is super hard really to put people into these distinct you know four categories it's ve it's very very hard to just put them into those categories and say that there's you know kind of nothing else involved so something to think about with this particular um personality test all right all of these the tests we've mentioned so far are really based on the self reporting where the individual fills out the items and that's a self-report. And we've talked about this isn't always accurate. So psychologists try to also use other ways to make it more accurate instead of just the personality tests. And they also use what we call projective techniques to assess personality instead. So now let's talk about them. A projective technique is where we encourage people to kind of project their personality characteristics onto something else. All right, something that's sort of unclear. So, for example, let me give you an example. If we say, okay, someone says, let me tell you about my friend's problem. The person really is describing their own problem. You know, they're projecting their problem onto someone else to try to get an answer. So, so you let's say something's going on in your life and you want advice from a friend. You tend to say, hey, let me tell you about, I have a friend who's going through this. But it's really your own problem that you're describing. So you're, you're projecting your own problem onto someone else just so that you can maybe get an answer to something or help you with something. So um, in doing that, um, there are two well-known what we call projective techniques. The first one is called the Rorschach ink blots. And what happens here is that researchers, psychologists, show people 10 cards. Each of the cards has a different ambiguous kind of ink blot picture on it. Um, we don't really know. It's not a clear cut picture. It's just a, you know, a ink blot that looks like a picture of some sort. And the researchers or the investigators or the psychologists ask the person to describe what they're seeing on their card. And then the psychologist will probe with further questions um, that kind of try to relate to the person's life. All right. And the, based on those answers that the person gives, um, that's where we're trying to figure out some of their personality characteristics. All right. A second projective technique is called the thematic a perception test or TAT for short. Um, this is a really interesting one. And I'll just, if I explain what it is, you'll know better than the definition. There are 31 picture cards involved with this particular test. However, the psychologist picks just a few of those cards to actually show to a person. The cards have kind of scenes on them, a picture on them, a scene that could include uh, just men, just women, men and women, neither men and women. You know, there's different scenes with people on the card. And the person um, who the test is being given to is asked to describe the scene on the card. Describe what led up to that picture, do you think? Describe what is happening now in that picture. Or describe what will happen, um, you know, after this picture, this still picture that they're looking at, all right? And that's a way to kind of get people's reactions or answers to things um, in trying to, you know, figure out someone's personality characteristics based on the answers they give to those questions after looking at those scenarios. The results from these things, unfortunately, um, are not very good for validity. They're good, they're good techniques to kind of research, to gather some information, but it's important to remember that these projective techniques are really not so good for making any decisions about an individual. Okay, so that's something important to remember there. So since the projective techniques that we just discussed are really not that useful 
um, psychologists have had to try other things as well. They've had to try implicit, what we call implicit personality tests, which really um, an implicit personality test is a procedure that measures some aspect of your personality without you being aware of it. So for example, what they try to do is pair up social words with pleasant or unpleasant words. For example, a person who pairs the words party, friend, and companion with, let's say, an unpleasant word, then they're probably nervous around others, okay? Because we can, you know, it's something that a, a person's not necessarily aware of that, their personality trait of being necessarily nervous, but the way they go about kind of making associations among things like words will kind of imply that they're a nervous person, all right? However, this kind of test, again, just like the projective tests, um, these implicit personality tests, they're useful for research, but again, they're not really um, great for making decisions, specific decisions about an individual. So again, while we're trying to look at the formal personality tests that are all self-reports to some of projective techniques as personality um, indicators, as well as these implicit personality tests. There's not one that's perfect, okay? So um, what do we need to remember then about personality tests? Is that they can help they, they can help assess personality, but we should always interpret the results cautiously. I know I mentioned that before, so that's important to remember. And by this we mean that the, the tests, because the tests are not entirely accurate, any of the ones that we've talked about, a score that seems characteristic of a psychological disorder may actually end up showing that it occurs in many people who don't actually have that disorder. So we, the, the, real conclusion is that we need to look beyond the test score before we kind of draw any conclusion about someone's personality and if that personality is really a, a psychologic becomes a psychological disorder all right so it's interesting to it we really do have to remember that and be cautious all right um the last slide is an interesting piece because it's an aspect um that we actually try to use personality tests for, and that is something called criminal profiling. This this end of the chapter section is really interesting, so you should go back and read up on the research on this um, and the little study that they did. But sometimes psychologists uh, try to help police in their investigations by constructing personality profiles of, well, what kind of person would actually commit this kind of crime? I'm sure you've seen these stories. Um, these are this is actually a job that psychologists sometimes do is try to create these personality profiles. Who would actually commit this crime that was committed? All right. And we try to, so we try to find people who would fit that. All right. Um, however, again, going back to being cautious about these kinds of things and, and identifying personality traits because personality traits are only moderately accurate predictors, okay, of people's behavior in certain situations, they're not highly accurate, only moderately accurate, then criminal profiling does not always work uh, to catch a criminal. So a psychologist may help the police kind of create this profile of the person, and then the police would take that and um, investigate further to try to find someone who might fit that profile. But again, it doesn't always work. And the police, meaning the police don't always catch the person because these are not highly accurate, 100%, um, you know, non-questionable kinds of um, profiles that may be created. All right. Because again, personality traits are, you know, not 100% accurate in how they predict what a person will do or behave. All right. So all of this is really interesting information on personality. We had theorists in this particular chapter. We had their pieces of their theories that always are interesting to look at. We had descriptions of personalities and how we actually measure them through, through tests, through items, through um, other kinds of things that are not exactly tests. And there's lots of information related to personality. And what it comes down to is, you know, can we explain people's behavior through their personalities? There's so many things we've talked about for explanations of behavior. Personality is just another piece in that discussion. Okay. All right. So please read chapter 14 if you haven't already, and we will discuss more in class.